The healthcare detective Frank Lally has written a book for Simon & Schuster about how to get affordable health care. Call to your best health care now. It's available online, in-store, wherever fun books are sold. Mr. Lally is also the health correspondent for Parade and the former editor of Money and George magazines and senior advisor to healthcare or at healthcare.com. And for those of you who have been listening to him for a while, there was a trial, a magical trial at the University of Pennsylvania a while ago. And Frank is here with news. Yes, I am. I'm yes. here and I'm well. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. I mean, you know, the, the overall message is that you can live with a serious illness. So you can live with cancer. You can live with things that, that, that threaten your life. Uh, I've had a blood cancer. It's called multiple myeloma. I've had it now for 12 years. And I'm doing fine. Um, does, it, does it cause me to worry from time to time? You bet your life it does. But I'm doing fine. So... Back 12 years ago, uh, my doctors feared that I might be getting multiple myeloma just from my blood work and the fact that I was fatigued and a couple of other uh, things like that, and anemic. But actually, my system was smoldering, and that is I sort of had this blood cancer. It wasn't causing any, any real symptoms as of any seriousness, but I, they could detect it but it hadn't really activated. So it really wasn't cancer yet. It was like this pre-cancerous stage, this smoldering stage. Some people live that way for 20 years or longer. They don't, they never know they're in danger. Uh, and in some cases, um, in most cases, after about 18 months of this smoldering, uh, a, a switch is, is flicked and, and, and it becomes real cancer. So that happened to me and I got a phone call Actually, while I was in London working for Reader's Digest International in a little hotel room from my doctor saying, hey, ay, 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 the latest blood test, uh, you, you actually knew now have multiple myeloma. I could feel, you know, it's London. This, the room was smaller already, but it was the walls were closing in on me. And I heard myself say to the doctor, so this is deadly serious. And he said, you know, it's serious but it's not necessarily deadly. We have medicines and we'll have more and we think we can keep you in pretty good shape for a long time. So I ended up with a guy named Ken Anderson up at Dana-Farber, Dana-Farber, um, where he had done all this research for a medicine called Rivlimid. He gave me Rivlimid and I went for years and years and years just taking a pill a day and I was fine. But then about four years ago, the pill just stopped working. Uh -huh. And the way I discovered that is I fell down a flight of stairs backwards at one of my doctor's houses. I was over there for a dinner party and I fell. Well, well good timing. Tumor. Yeah, at the timing and the place. But I had, it turned out I had this big tumor on my, on, uh, that I didn't realize I had on, on my left hip. And it weakened my left leg, and who knows? I uh, down I go down down the stairs. I'm actually fine from the fall, but then they did X-rays and they see uh, tumors all over my body. So okay, then it's time for real intervention, and I got a stem cell transfer uh, transfer at uh, Memorial Sloan uh, Kettering. Uh, and, and by the way, that's a real ordeal—a a stem cell transfer. Uh, and it didn't work. <laughs> so, all right. When all else fails, and this is what I tell people all the time, when all else fails, that's the time to really pursue a clinical trial. They're experimental. They're not proven at all. They're testing stuff. You don't want to rush into a clinical trial. Never, never, never. But when all else fails, you really need one. So I was in that position four years ago, a little over four years ago. Luckily, I became the last person in a 20 patient trial. And you're right, Jill, it was down at the Perlman Center. That's uh, Ron Perlman's father, a real philanthropist down in Philadelphia. My doctor said, stop my down there. He's fantastic. So what happened is they harvest the T cells. These are the, uh, they are fierce fighters of disease. Um, and it's essentially a transfusion in one out one arm into the other, and they capture the T cells, rush it to the lab, add the magic sauce that they hope becomes a billion dollar drug from Novartis in this case. Um, 
<clears throat> and then they pump it back into your body and, you know, hey, it's supposed to work. Well, it doesn't always work, <laughs> okay, but it worked for me. And my tumors just shriveled up like raisins. Now, each year, I go back down to the Perlman Center and I get a head-to-toe PET scan looking for tumors. Uh, they inject you with radioactive stuff and it's essentially a sugar-based uh, uh, substance that goes, if there's any cancer there, the sugar goes to the cancer and it essentially lights up. So you can light up like a Christmas tree or they can be all dark. Um, so that's always a suspense and it makes me nervous wor worrying about it. Uh, but I'm, I am, I just had it, I just had it on Wednesday. I am completely cancer free. Um, and, and that's a miraculous, if not a miracle, only half the people in the trial got any benefit at all from this medicine, which, which actually didn't turn out to be very successful. Uh, and 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 most people, even the people who got some relief, got relief for only about two years. So I'm all the way entering my fifth year, and there's no one else uh, who's gotten a better benefit than that. So I kind I kind of go into the uh, history, into the medical uh, science books now. So as <clears throat> as I said to you, Jill, and you said this would be a pretty good title for my autobiography that I'm not going to write. Uh, way out on the bell curve. <laughs> I am way out. <laughs> Lost on the bell um, curve. <laughs> <laughs> I am way out there. Um, and do they have any explanation so, for that? I mean, other than your uh, uh, like really good intention? Uh, yeah, I think there are a couple of things. I mean, first of all, um, when I needed a, a stem cell transplant, I got one. And, and you know, I was in a clinic uh, setting and I didn't think, I, and this was at Columbia Presbyterian, a great hospital, but I was, I didn't think I was in a very good setting and I didn't think I was getting enough attention from my doctor. So I fired him and I moved on to Memorial Sloan Kettering where I got Sergio Garalt, a fantastic doctor who really took a personal interest in me. And, you know, as he does in all his patients, he, I've got his home phone number from day one. And, you know, when I needed a clinical trial, he got on the phone and I got on the phone. We called every uh, you know, health, any, every center, major medical center in the country uh, trying to line up uh, a spot for me. And that wouldn't have happened in, in a clinical center. And it wouldn't happen if I wasn't, you know, persistent as I was and, and if I didn't have a doctor who was really on my side. So that's an important thing. If you don't have a doctor on your side and you're on your own, if you ignore and don't realize what medicines you're taking and, you know, you just hope for the best, um, you know, you're setting yourself up for failure. Uh, you've got to be much more proactive than that. So I think that's a big part of it. Um, I didn't do it out of bravery, Jill. I did it out of fear, uh, but, but I did it. <laughs> so in the process, my case has now made some contributions to medical science and I'm actually very proud of that. Um, and, you know, it, it for for the very least, it has added more proof uh, that you should put off a clinical trial for as long as you can. You know, I only did it after that stem cell didn't work. Um, and, and then I really needed intervention, a serious experimental intervention. Um, and the stem cell didn't do anything. It didn't shrink my tumors. But... It strengthened my basic immune system. That's what the doctors think. So it, it, with, the, with your immune system strengthened just a bit more like that, you have more likely to get a success from the trial. So now Memorial Sloan Kettering has actually changed their procedures when they go into their clinical trials. They have all the patients take a stem cell transfer first to set themselves up for success in a trial. Uh, and that is new. Now, I wrote about a woman named Lori Alf, you may remember this, uh, who was at the Perlman Center really early, and, um, and she had uh, a stem cell. At that point, they were doing a stem cell followed immediately by uh, by by the by by the T cell immunity and essentially if it if if that combination of things just back to back within days didn't kill her it might cure her well she was lucky it cured her now that at least they give you some distance 
you get the stem cell, it's a real ordeal. You you recover enough from that, and then you go to the clinical trial. But the bottom line is still the bottom line. Stem cell is now part of the protocol, at least at Memorial Sloan Kettering and other places. They also learned from my case, and this is, again, what I said, wait until you really need this medicine, the, the, uh, the T cell or any immunology or any of these clinical trials, you've got to wait until the disease has developed to a point where the trial can be successful. So the doctors at Perlman just tried this T cell intervention on newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients, and it didn't work. So the theory is, if you don't have enough cancer in your body, for the T cells to attack, then it isn't successful. So you got to think about those T cells, these that really fight disease. You got to think about them as kind of like the Roman army. You know, when they were expanding, uh, they lived off the land. The more cells, and, and then in those cases, the more countries they conquered, the bigger they became, the more recruits they got. And that's the way the t, t cells work. The more the T cells kill the cancer, the more T cells there are, <laughs> it's an exploding uh, benefit to the patient. So the T cells get bigger and they get stronger and they work uh, really as effectively as they possibly can. So, um, so Jill, that's, I mean, just one, one more thing about, you know, we, we, <laughs> when I got my booster shot for the uh, good old COVID, um, uh, you know, I asked you, you know, am I really immunocompromised? Because we, we hadn't done this this trial yet. Um, I mean, this, this head to toe yet. Am I immunocompromised or am I, I, am I immunostrong? Well, now we know. Okay, I came out with this very clean bill of health. I am immunostrong. Now, and that's 12 years living with a blood cancer. Now, one more note. If that trial at Perlman had been a NIH, uh, you know, an NIH trial, a government trial, uh, National Institutes of Health trial, I wouldn't have gotten in because no one over 70 can get into an NIH trial. That is really wrongheaded. Um, it, there shouldn't be an ageism barrier to whether a patient gets a treat gets a treatment into a trial when they really need it to stay alive. I wouldn't be alive today if that had been an NIH trial as opposed to a commercial trial where the commercial companies can accept uh, people over seventy based on their need. Um, so, Jill, any any thoughts? Any questions? Uh, I think that that is fantastic. I, I mean, fantastic all the way and just really good to have a, a thinking human being with that experience. And I think that uh, what what I would like to do, if you're willing along the way, is just por pursue more the um, the idiosyncrasies of getting into these things because, you know, that's the sort of thing that really ends up being more – you know, on, on, what I'm going to say, the, the broader point is, on top of having to worry about getting into a trial, and you had to worry about that, and yes, your physical health, which, you know, all of which knocks you back, let's just say 50% on the, gee, I can focus and be optimistic um, scale, you know, to be up against arbitrary exclusions hmm. is um, not right. So no, I, I think that no. that's just – I, I think that's worth a little more um, detecting and uh, working on. Well, the NIH should really reconsider that. Um, age, you know, chronological age tells you something, okay, but it's not – Not everything. Not everything. No, not at all. It's, it's, and, and especially in, a, in an instance where you have tried everything, right, <laughs> for years and years, all the medicines, all the protocols – and nothing's working, okay? And at that point, what is your physical health and what is your odds of actually getting a benefit from this intervention? That should be the test. At one point, I was told, uh, I'm sorry, uh, there's there are three people vying for the last spot in this trial, and I'm sorry you didn't make the cut, okay? That was on a Friday. Now, that was the low point 
of my 12 years uh, with this blood cancer. On Monday, I got a phone call saying, oh, sorry, <laughs> it was a mistake on my part. You're back in. Okay, now what happened is there's a real conversation by the doctors, at, and this happens in all these clinical trials, all the doctors at the, at the facility, at the hospital, at the, at the cancer center, they meet at least weekly and they debate who should get into the trial, okay? And it's a real debate. And every doctor is a champion for their patient or, or, or they say, okay, we've gotten to a point where this person is too sick and will not, be, will not benefit. So having, a, first of all, Sergio Garral to get on the phone and call these cancer centers with me pleading for a spot on the trial, which failed in one instance after another, and then finally connecting with a guy like Stodmeyer, who then championed me in these meetings. So he missed a meeting, and I was out. And he came back, and I was in. Look, um, is luck involved? Yeah, there is. But there's also persistence and finding partners who can help you. If you do that, you can live with serious illness, but you need to be engaged and you need to be a champion for yourself as well. That's my message for today. Thank you, Frank, the healthcare detective and senior advisor to healthcare.com. Send questions or concerns about finding affordable healthcare to healthcare detective at robinhoodradio.com. Frank will try to address as many of your questions as he can on future broadcasts. Also look for his book, Your Best Healthcare Now, available online, in-store, and on my desk.